Testing, testing, one, two. Well, well Jermaine, how, how's life been since uh, defending your title against CJ Dillashaw on Fight Island? Life's been uh, great. Life's been full. I've been eating a lot. Um, just taking my time to uh, smell the roses a little bit and enjoy the fruits of my labor and just getting my life in order. Um, but yeah, other than that, short answer, life's been good. What do you, uh, when you say life in order, what do you mean? Is that like, because you had hinted about things you wanted to do maybe outside of the fight game after your fight too. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, all the in-between things that you need to get done in between a fight camp. Um, when I'm in the training camp, I literally almost have time to do nothing, you know, because I'm just so dialed in. So for me to actually have a little bit of downtime, as soon as the fight was over, I was pretty much hitting the floor running, just trying to get things in order, trying to figure out what's the next step to get everything done so that when the next training camp does come around, I can just focus on that. And uh, I think that's what's helped me get to this point. And, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So and it felt like as soon as you won, uh, everyone's like, oh, the Sean O'Malley fight's next, the Henry Cejudo fight's the Marlon Vera. So if you had to match make the Bantamweight division before you return in June, which matchups would you like to see? If, they, if you were Mick Maynard and Sean Shelby? <sighs> I will whoop all their asses no matter what. Honestly, I feel that's how I honestly feel. Um, if I had a match make, I'm going to go by who's the number one contender. I, I don't believe in cutting the line. I believe in doing things the hard way, the way I had to do it. I didn't get any handouts. I had to fight through everybody in the top five pretty much, top ten. And uh, there was no shortcuts to just jump the line and elevate to a title shot opportunity. Even when I had a number one contender fight, I think you guys could remember that the UFC wasn't so keen in giving me that shot that I earned. Um, and who knows why? I guess maybe my style. It seems to be OK when the Dagestanis do it, but it's like it's weird when I do it. I don't know. It's, uh, it's like this weird disconnect I'm trying to figure out. Maybe, like I said, maybe it's because I'm not Dagestani. I just got to shave my mustache, and I think things would be OK. But if I had to pick somebody, uh, give me the money fight. Whichever one that is, I think is personally O'Malley. And people may think, oh, you're just going to take him down and steamroll him. I think I would do that to anybody. So he can catch me the same way I could take him down, and it would be a short night for him, the same way he could catch me, and it could be a short night for myself as well. So if that's the case, would you want to see maybe Henry fight Cheeto in the meantime? I would like to see Henry show that he's serious about this, you know? I, I don't know. I just I can't take the guy serious. And I, there's nothing against him. He's accomplished so much. Um, so I don't want to, like, rag on him in, in that regards, but uh, I do think if he actually gets back and competes against somebody to make it go like, okay, this guy's for real, and, and I do understand his, his, what he's trying to do. He doesn't want to take a number one contender fight, because if he loses, it, it, it's just, he would rather lose in a title shot opportunity, and I think that's where he's at right now. I'm like, no one told you to retire, bro. Like, we all knew you were going to come back. Like, what, what stupid games are you playing? You know, so that's on you. The, the, the vision has passed you by, and what you've done three years ago doesn't quite hold a candle to what everyone's doing right now and competing. You know, this, this game, I think, is kind of past him. And he's a smart dude. He's getting older. But that fight doesn't, it doesn't really move me to go, oh, yeah, I can't wait. Like, I'm not getting up out of the morning like, yeah, I'm fighting Henry Cejudo. I fight Oman, I'm like, yeah, this is a big fucking fight. I fight Cheeto Vera, I'm like, this is a dangerous and a, and a big fucking fight. You know, that's the way I feel about that. With Henry, it's just like, I'm fighting the, the the king cringe, whatever you want to call him. I don't know. It's, it's just whatever. And looking at your last fight, I don't know if you saw, but uh, when for the anatomy of a fighter, they showed kind of Habib watching your fight. They didn't show what the positions or everything, but he said something about uh, this is his position. He's the best in the world here. Speaking of your fight, I think it's when you're on top of TJ. So what is, I, were you aware of that? And what do you think about when like Habib, who many consider the best wrestler, it, one of the best, is calling you the best in certain positions? Uh, it, it was cool. It's um, really nice to see someone of his, I guess, uh, stature who recognizes what other people are doing. Um, Khabib is one of the greatest on top position with great control. He takes you down, he drowns you, and it's really hard to, for you to get back to your feet. Uh, so I think even him being in the back room for that little bit, he was working out with Islam and Hasbula came, came through. Shout out Hasbula. <laughs> uh, they, they got to see Marab and I rolling a little bit. I think he still, I mean, he wasn't like just watching us, but you know, I'm pretty sure he saw like glimpses and pieces of what we were doing and then to see that happen in the fight, despite TJ's one arm, Mr. Potato Head, um, arm falling off. Um, 
I, I think he knows, like, you can recognize skill and talent when someone's doing something, you know? Even the same thing, like, Islam might not have fought, like, the best guys, but he was dominating to the point where everyone was like, he is the best guy, because you can recognize what he's doing and how he's doing it, and uh, you can kind of go, okay, there's something to this. It's not just he's beating up these lower level guys, because these are high level dudes that he's doing it to. And I think Khabib is just one of those guys who can recognize the, um, he can appreciate and see what people are doing, looking at the matchups and, and analyzing it from that standpoint. And going off of that, uh, during your fight week, people would obviously ask you, like, oh, what's next, what's next, what's next? And you would say, like, the top five, but you would mention Umar Nurmagomedov a few times, even though he's not even in the top ten. Is that just you recognizing his skill level in a, an eventual title fight down the line? Well, the UFC asked me about him. They did, like, a top 15, and they gave me names. So I watch everybody. I do my own podcast, and I break down all the fights every single weekend, and Umar fights, and... Uh, I break him down and, and analyze his skill set as well. So I know he's a threat. Um, styles make fights. And I know if we were to compete, it would be a very competitive one. I think the difference would come to come down to who could be a little bit more tenacious and who gets tired first. But um, right now, those conversations, I'm not even entertaining it. He's, he's got some work to do still. And uh, I think he'll be in this conversation probably this time next year. And two more, two more quick ones for me. Uh, Saturday is going to be Frankie Edgar's last fight before he retires. So you being a New York native, what were some of the memories you had of Frankie coming up in this area? Well, of course, the Gray Maynard fight. <laughs> That's like the biggest one for me, honestly. And uh, then you got the, the, the BJ Penn fight. For him to beat BJ Penn the way that he did, who was just like a juggernaut at the time and just seemed like no one was going to ever like defeat him, you know? And then he came through and then they had the immediate rematch and he beat him again and showed like, yo, I'm Frankie Edgar, I'm the answer, I'm here to stay. So um, I always wish I had an opportunity to train with Frankie. I thought that would have been some magic and I thought we would have had some great um, chemistry just feeding off of one of, one of <coughs> Jesus, feeding off of each other. Um, but we never had that opportunity. And the same thing with Dominic Cruz, Uriah Faber. I always said if I'm not gonna train with these guys, you know, that I would like to fight these legends of the sport. Uh, so, fortunately, I, I'm happy that we never actually fought. Um, I respect Frankie a lot and um, definitely going to be dialed in for that one. And I hope he has a good send-off, you know. I just hope he can do what he was doing to Cheeto and just not get caught and um, gets the job done so he could go out on the way he wants to go out. And finally, do you have any thoughts on the main event between Israel and Alex? That's a dangerous fight, man. I can see Izzy countering him because Pereira is, is preaching that he's going to bring the fight to Izzy. And if he does that, we've seen what he did to Robert Whitaker being reckless. And he could counter strike very, very well. And that could be the difference in that fight. Um, if Pereira takes his time. It only takes one, <clears throat> the great equalizer, that old faithful lefty that he has. And uh, he's been doing some great work with um, Glover Teixeira. But I do think Izzy's going to grapple him a bit, push him against the cage, and try to slow him down, so to speak. He's a big dude, man. That guy's massive. He stood next to Dominic Reyes, and I was really blown away at the frames because I didn't know who was the lightweight, the light heavyweight at that point. Um, but I, I, I'm leaning towards Izzy, but I'm, I've been in this sport long enough to know that anything can happen, but uh, the same way people gave me no chance to beat Jan, which was just, like, laughable. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great fight. I think the, I think the fans are going to be in for a good show this time because I think Pereira is going to keep true to his word and really push the pace and, and bring a good fight. So I think this one might end in a knockout. Aljo over here. Uh, congratulations on your recent title defense. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't give you credit. They say, oh, TJ, Mr. Potato Head arm that you said and this. One of the person who didn't give you credit was TJ himself. After the fight, he said, oh, if it wasn't for the shoulder thing, if I didn't have these injuries, like, I'm better than him. I, that's what I'm so upset about it. I can beat him. Like, what's your response to that? You know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know? <laughs> I was respectful to the guy. After the fight, I'm always respectful. Win or lose, I don't give a shit. I, I'm here to compete. I'm here to raise the stakes, my words versus your words, and go out there and really figure out who is who. And can you put your money where your mouth is? The guy said he knocked out Cody Garbrandt. Okay, you get, you get a hand clap. Okay, you did it twice, you get a hand clap. But all of a sudden, you lose, now it's a crutch. The guy literally reached into his jock strap, pulled out a crumpled piece of paper and just started whipping out a, a laundry list of excuses after telling me I'm the one with the built-in excuses. I'm like, dude, if I lost, I would've just ate the L. Like, that's just how I am. Like, eat the L, bro. Just shut up. Go away, fix your arm, and come back. I've had a torn labrum. In the beginning of my career, I fought seven pro fights like that. 
So Big Whoop, bro, you're not anything special. You've done something that a lot of people do. You just fought with one leg, pretty much, against Corey Sanhagen. But what's the difference? The styles. I take anybody down, it's a bad night for anybody, especially when you're in that position where you allow me to get on top and posture up and land some big damage. So he can say whatever he wants. I'm sure he had training sessions where he was winning. And I'm sure he came out doing training sessions the same way he did with me. You pop it back in and you go back and you finish the training session. And I'm sure he, had, he was confident enough to know, hey man, I'm still getting through these training sessions. I, I believe in myself. I still think I can win. Kudos for him for having that self-belief, but you're delusional as fuck. Uh, you said you, you know, you're a purist, you want to go against the number one ranked guy. The number two ranked guy right now is Marab, and I know you guys... Is he? Yeah, he's I, I didn't see the new ranking, so I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, he's number two, and I mean, I know that's a fight that obviously you guys, you don't really want, but I mean, it's a really good possibility that you're the champion, and he's ranked number one soon. I mean, what happens? What are you guys going to do? Well, I think the UFC, like, guarantees that he's get that matchup, and then uh, that he's fighting for the title like he's a lock. And then uh, we figure it out from there. Um, as of right now, I got some things to do um, still in this division. And I'm still entertaining going up to 145. He's also talked about going down to 125. And we'll figure it out. We do so much for each other, we're j it's just not going to happen. you know. So that's where I'm at with that. And um, I'm sure he feels the same exact way that I do. I, I mean, he just came to Abu Dhabi and Dubai to help me with my training camp. He'd been there for the other training camps. Um, the same thing for me. I went to Salt Lake City in probably, probably his last five fights in the UFC. So iron sharpens iron. I didn't get here without him. He didn't get there. I would like to think he didn't get to where he's at without me helping, you know, and uh, I recognize that. So that's a, that's a friendship that I would never want to ruin over, over what? I mean, I don't know. This, this thing, it comes and goes. This is just a moment in time. Like, eventually I'm going to lose. And I'm okay with that. I don't know when it's going to be. And life goes on. And that's kind of the way I live my life. So I, I don't put a lot of stock into all these things and stress myself out. I just take it day by day, fight by fight, and uh, let the good times keep rolling in. And right now, we're, in the, we're having the, uh, the good times. The, one of the narratives of the TJ fight was where he's talking about how impressive you are on the ground. And he said that he didn't wrestle D1. I'm a D1 wrestler. And it, it seems like the guys who don't wrestle D1, they carry this chip on their shoulder where they're always trying to prove themselves to that. Uh, would you say that's an advantage, having that? Oh, 100%. That's why the D3 guys, we get off when we, when we beat these D1 guys. <laughs> that's like one of our, one of our like, uh, I guess, what would you put it? Like, I don't know, like laundry list that beat a D1 guy, ruined his day. He thought he was big, bigger than whatever he thought. I don't know. Sometimes those guys have a real egotistical approach. And I love, the, I love D1s, wrestling. Like, overall, pound for pound, those guys are definitely better than D3. But there's guys at the D3 level that can compete D1 that either didn't have the grace to go, didn't have the, 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 uh, the financial means to go as well. And sometimes you just get dealt a shitty hand, you know? So I could have wrestled D1. Um, I didn't get the opportunity. I didn't have the resources. I started wrestling in 10th grade, and I closed that gap relatively quick. I think if you're a student of the game with anything in life, that you can do that. It just depends on how much time you put in. And for him to really just try to shit on my wrestling, I, I didn't really get that mental approach. You could say you're better, but to say like, oh, D3, I wrestled D1, I'm like, dude, you never All-American. You never, I don't even know if you even went to the national tournament. So you probably wouldn't even place in the D3 level nationals. Probably wouldn't even qualify. So, and I'm not trying to keep kicking TJ while he's down, like, but the dude does it to himself. He just like, dude, just shut up. Like, I, I don't want to talk about you, but you keep making me have to talk about you. And if you keep doing that, I'll be petty and just keep doing it as well. You know, I, I congratulated him. For, not, even congr not congratulated him. I shook his hand, or I think I shook his hand. I don't know. I gave him a pat on the back. Just told him, like, yo, I thank you for the opportunity. Like, you're one of the guys I've watched for a very long time. A big, big inspiration on type, in terms of style. And I can always give credit to my um, potential opponents, you know? Because I'm just a big fan of the sport. But then when he goes and says stuff like that, I'm just like, dude, you make it hard for me to want to wanna put the pettiness aside and just brings out the evil Kermit Aljo, you know? So if you want to keep doing that, I'll keep doing that all day long. I, I got all day. My last question, you just talked about your YouTube and, you know, you like to analyze and break down and preview stuff. A any chance we ever get to see you on, like, the actual broadcast team calling the fights? I would like to. ESPN, if you guys are out there listening. Uh, I think that would be interesting. I've done it, I think, three times, and I had a great time doing it. 
But you have to make sure you do your homework. As uh, Dominic Cruz says, make sure you do your homework. <laughs> DC has been doing his homework of late. Um, but yeah, I can see myself doing that at some point. Fighting is fun, but watching it sometimes is a little bit easier, less stressful. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't wait to watch the fights this weekend so I can just be a spectator, have a couple of uh, drinks, and just relax. Al Jermaine, just down here. Um, you got to spend some time with Leon Edwards uh, in Abu Dhabi. How do you think he does against uh, Usman in the trilogy? Uh, I mean, that first round was a really good round for him. I do, I do think maybe the, the pressure might have gotten to him and maybe zapped his energy a bit. I know he talked about that a little bit, not like the pressure, but talked about like kind of, I don't know if he said like he was in a trance almost, like just wasn't pulling the trigger. And in the 11th hour, he managed to do it. I think he's always dangerous throughout the entire fight, and I think that's the difference between him and Usman. As, uh, you know, the striker is always more, more likely to knock you out versus the wrestler who's more likely to grind for 25 minutes or less. So I think that's the difference. He's always going to be dangerous in that regard, but Usman was pretty handily winning that fight and on cruise control on his way to winning. So I would lean towards uh, Usman, but again, one shot, headshot, dead, you know? So <laughs> that's all it takes. And I'm a big fan of both of those guys. So I feel, I'm like torn when I watch that fight. You know, I got a fellow Jamaican, um, and then I got Usman, someone I've actually hung out with time and time again, and uh, have a little bit of a relationship with. So yeah, other than that, I, I don't really know how it's gonna go. Um, may the best man win. And I know you like to break down fights, so obviously if we get to see John Jones return at heavyweight against Francis Ngannou, how do you think that goes down? Damn, you guys hit me with the tough ones. <laughs> I hang out with Francis. I got started in MMA because of John Jones. I feel like me picking against any one of those guys. But I can see the fight being John using a lot of wrestling. I think that would be the path of least resistance to winning. Um, Francis is big, strong, powerful. It just how well can John carry the weight? I don't know. And how well can he do when he gets hit by a heavyweight? That's the big ultimate equalizer. Francis got that power and. Uh, to try to wrestle a guy like that for 25 minutes. I mean, we've seen Stipe do it, but I think Francis is going to be smart enough to do the homework to make sure he can at least compete with him long enough that he can land a big shot that can probably end the fight. And then last one, there's rumors uh, about Colby going up against Hamza. If that does go down, how do you think that one plays out? I think people are sleeping on Colby. Colby's a dog. Hamza's dangerous, he's explosive, but I don't think Hamza can do what he did to Kevin Holland to Colby and exert that much energy that early on in the fight because if he does that against a cardio machine like that and he doesn't get him out of there, that could be a long night for Hamza. Um, I'm sure he's going to be well prepared for that fight as well, cardio wise, but I think he's going to have to be a little bit more calculated to go with a guy like Colby because he's going to be there the entire time to fight. And we've seen that with the Usman fight, we've seen that with the Masvidal fight, even the Damian Maia fight. Like the guy is willing to put his face on the line, eat punches to impose his will, get you down on the ground and just make it a dog fight. Thank you. Who, Algerman, uh, just in terms of the move to 145, was that something you've, is that something you've been thinking about for a while? It, it just seems like you, you still in your current division have so much to do, but obviously ambitions driven you your whole career. What's the mindset behind the move? Really to avoid fighting a best friend. <laughs> and so I can eat a little bit more. I'm, I'm 170 pounds right now. I'm a, I'm a big boy right now. I know people were talking about me going to Perth and fight. I'm like, dude, relax. I just did two five-round training camps, you know? So I got to let my body not, like right now, I'm eating everything because I can't stabilize. Because once you do such a drastic weight cut, it's so hard to get your body back to a norm. I thought I would have been, like, good by now. But I'm still, like, in this weird, these cravings. And I don't know, it's so bad. You, I, might be, I might be pregnant. <laughs> but, but you as a competitor too, I mean it must, the idea of it, the prospect of it must excite you. So many different fighters, I mean it, what a great opportunity for you too as a, as a competitor. Those guys are dangerous man. I just watched Arnold Allen and Calvin Cater, those are some dangerous dudes, you know, and they're a lot bigger than me. But I do think my style is one of those things, like if we grappled, and I grappled with any one of those guys on a Jiu Jitsu night, I mean come on. I don't think it's even close. That's my personal opinion. I mean people could tell me I'm wrong, I don't think it's even close. Um, in terms of domination and dominant positions, getting to the mount, getting to side control, getting to back mount, and just keeping these guys there, or even finishing them. That's what I truly do feel what would happen if we grappled. But in a fight, it's different. 
they got the size, they're going to have a little bit more power, but I do think I would have a little bit more power as well. And I would be forced to kind of sitting down on my punches a little bit more. But at the end of the day, my style is my style. I can be like a Kobe and just grind you and push you against the cage until I can drag you down to the ground. And then once you do that, I think it's uh, off to the races in terms of how long you're going to last. And I know it's, it's hard to think too long term, but if you're able to be successful and win another title, I mean, that, that, that redefines your legacy. I mean, that's got to be a, dri a driving point for you as well. Oh, for sure. Um, and not to change the gears, but like I, I've trained with Bryce Mitchell. What is he, top 10, top 6, something like that? And the guy is dangerous. He's beating guys, finishing guys. And we have some really good, like he'll say, it, he, we've had some really good um, competitions in the room. And that lets me feel confident that if I were to go up, I can have success as well. Obviously, I wouldn't be looking to fight a guy like Bryce because um, we've trained together so many different times. But yeah, if I did go up to 45, it would be to chase legacy and um, maybe just give myself a fresh start kind of thing and just make this sport fun. Because my thing is like, I, I would retire once this isn't as fun and cutting weight is not fucking fun. It's, that's the least fun part about this job. So if I could go to uh, 45 and have a little bit more life and I could be like, oh, okay, I can make weight four times out of the year and have more fun doing it, I would definitely enjoy that. And I think that could be ideal in the sense that I could still make money, I could still compete, do what I love, and um, not put so much wear and tear on my body, if that makes sense. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at mentally. A couple questions uh, over here on your right. What's up? Uh, who's the loudest in the gym, Sarah or Longo? <laughs> Well, if they're both in there, you can't tell. You really can't tell. But Matt comes in with the grand entrance, and he's definitely really, really, really loud. And who's the funniest? Because um, they've got – Sarah's gregarious, but Longo's low-key. He's pretty goddamn funny. Longo's funny, but Matt's just like – he can make a joke out of anything kind of thing. And he's, like, super witty. Kind of reminds me of a Connor, just, like, right off the rip. Just, like, he'll walk in and just start – ripping on something, you're just like, how the hell do you do that? Like, you just walk in and just find something to pick at, and then he could just start attacking you, and you're just like, wow. But th that's how, I don't know, he's just quick-witted like that. I don't know if it's like, I don't know, he's good. But I, I, was, I would lean towards Matt on that one. And on a slightly more serious tone, uh, you were talking about your weight, your eating, it's not mentally there. Uh, Patty Pimblett famously thinks he might have an eating disorder because he balloons up so much. What are your thoughts on just like yourself, him, you know, other fighters perhaps, and just the weight, and the the food eating, like eating disorders perhaps? What are what are, how does how this process? Yeah, it's it's not good. I do think when like whenever I'm not fighting though, I'm not training, my eating slows down, so I kind of stabilize. But I feel like right after the fight, you just you go through this time period where it could last a month, and you're just eating like an insane amount of food where you're just swollen. It just doesn't feel good. Like, and I know this, I consciously know this, and somehow I'm still stuffing my face. It's the weirdest thing. Um, but I'm hoping like after this weekend, I could just be like, okay, now it's time to chill. I can start working out and uh, make it a little bit more of a normal thing so I could get down to like 65 and then maybe start working out a little bit more and then I could get down to 60. And then I could realistically look at the next time period where I can fight, maybe it's April again. So uh, yeah, it's tough. And uh, I know, he gets huge, though, man. I don't get that big. Well, he I've, starts 20 pounds heavier, but yeah. Yeah, well, I've gotten, yeah. And I've gotten up to 176, and that was just disgusting. And it hurt just to walk up the stairs. So <laughs> I don't even know how he does it. It's, it's uh, mind-blowing, but his transformation is fascinating to, to watch. Fair enough. Are you eligible? Do you think that uh, O'Malley didn't get the credit he deserved in his performance against Jan because of the controversial decision? Yeah, but there was nothing controversial about it. People were screaming robbery. It wasn't a robbery. If you go back and watch okay. the fight and you're not emotionally charged because you made a bet, you'll be like, okay, I see why O'Malley won. I went back and I watched it. And I did a whole thing while watching on my podcast and I did like a whole review and I went round by round Counting the punches, counting the takedowns, the duration of the takedowns, what did he do with the takedowns, and O'Malley won the fight. I mean, you could try to sway it differently with the takedowns, but he didn't slam him down. He took him down to air, air yawn, took him down, but O'Malley landed on his hands, and then he sat to his butt. It's not like he got slammed on his back. 
You know, I'm like, oh shit, that would have hurt if that was on a concrete floor. He landed on his hands, he, the guy was fine, you know? So you gotta, you gotta look at it like, what does more damage? And I think O'Malley did more damage in that fight. And I think if he had lost, I agree with him when he said that he would have gotten more respect because they'd be like, oh, you, did a, you had a really good fight with the number one contender guy, that, that guy's a dog. And then the same thing for myself, I beat him, Jan, and then people start making all these excuses. I'm like, there's no winning. Sometimes there's just no winning with the fans. It's just like, all you gotta do is just keep winning and let the history books tell the story for you, you know? So kudos to him, sign the contract. Al Joe. <laughs> Al Joe, what's going on, brother? There's, How no, are there's you? no contract, by the way. So as far as picking fights, I know you're a champion right now. How much say do you have in the opponent that the UFC gives you? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I get that luxury. I know it's different case by case for everybody. So yeah. if they go April, you're fighting Marab, what happens? Well, by one, I respectfully decline. And two, I'm not fighting Marab. And uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I th we haven't had the conversation yet. I'm still in like this transition period of changing like management or staying with management. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, like, like I said before, I'm, I'm trying to clean up my house before I jump into something else. And I, I want to make sure I have everything in order so I could go in with like a fresh mind again and just get ready to focus on the next opponent, the next challenge. And that's really it. So when I do have that conversation with Dana, <clears throat> Dana and my voice, I, I, I went pretty hard last night. I'm sorry, guys. Went hard to paint last night. Um, I'm paying for it all day today, hangover. But uh, yeah, when we have that conversation, we'll figure out what's the biggest fight. Because at the end of the day, like I said, I could lose this fight, this belt, the next fight. OK, so am I going to take a fight that's not going to pay me as much? No, I'm going to take the one that I'd rather take the risk of losing, which you always take a risk, and uh, make as much money as I can while I have this time in the sun. You know, Because everyone has their time. Every time will pass for everybody. and. Just got to do what I can to provide for myself and my family. So while there's no clear-cut number one contender right now, do you really think Cejudo's not the guy? Because if you're chasing legacy, like you said, wouldn't that be a name that you want on your resume? Like, yes, but at the same time, no, because the guy hasn't fought. It's just like, like even when Bisbee came back and he fought GSP, I'm just like, I don't know if I would have done that. Like, because, yeah, he's GSP, but the guy hasn't fought in X amount of years. Like, why are you taking, like, I feel like the risk is on us. So, if I beat Say you know, you beat a guy coming off the couch. Oh, he was off for three years. There's always going to be a narrative that people are going to have and try to discredit you. You know what I mean? So it's like, why not fight someone who's actually been in here competing? Give me the guy who's competing, who's the number one guy, who just beat the number one guy. Well, that's you. You're like the Roddy Dangerfield of MMA. You can't get no respect. I don't know who any of those guys are, but I, I'll take it. <laughs> but even... Um, so Cejudo would obviously be a legacy fight. O'Malley would be the money fight. You don't know which one you're going to get next, but even 145 is possibly an option. Would you entertain anything or just a title fight? Would you take a non-title fight at 145? Like, right, if I could just fight at 45 for the hell of it, I'd do it right now. I'll do it in February. I would do it in February if I can keep the belt, fight at 45, not have to cut that much weight, and it would be a three-round fight. Give me a three-round fight, I'll walk through that. Like a, that that's easy work. Easy work. For sure. And but yeah, they're going to try and make it a five round, and I don't want to do that. We had Frivola in here yesterday talking about how good you are, and he's a 55er, and then Menace Bermudez would always sing your praises, and he was a 45er, so I think you uh, could definitely win some fights moving up. I appreciate it. Den yeah, Dennis and I had some, some interesting sparring matches, and uh, I remember when Frivola first came down to Long Island, back to Long Island, to train, and uh, we rolled, I think, one day, and then I asked him if he could spar with me, and I didn't know anything about the guy. I knew he was undefeated. Came in like a juggernaut, and uh, the first thing I did was I just took him down. <laughs> so, yeah, we had some fun and some fun sparring sessions and uh, some fun rolls. So, yeah, I, I think I could hold my own with those guys. But, again, when you're talking about being punched in the face, that, that, that changes the entire dynamic. It's not a wrestling match. It's not a jujitsu match. It's, uh, it's an MMA fight. And then I know you're very analytical, and you know the way you size somebody up? When you sized up Andrew Tate, granted he's bigger than you, did you sense some realness there? Is he legit? Uh, he's got some skill. I don't think he's the best guy. I mean, I think you could watch the tape and analyze his skill and his technique yourself. But um, he's got some talent. I mean, when he was doing it full time, I'm sure he looked a lot cleaner than he does now. And that, that happens with anybody. If you stop doing it for a certain amount of time, you're not going to look as good and as sharp. So uh, I think now he just trains for a hobby from what he was telling me, just to stay in shape, him and his brother and whoever he's fucking around with. But. Uh, 
Top G. Over here, Ajo. Uh, just two quick questions uh, over here. Um, are you coming out with any uh, Aljo backpacks? Any uh, Aljo? <laughs>